Hi, this is Nick Freitas and welcome back to Making the Argument. Today we're going to be going over a word that gets used very frequently and I think it actually gets misused very frequently. And we can debate all day long whether or not it's a casual misunderstanding or a deliberate misunderstanding, but I think it's important to have the discussion. So let's talk about the word democracy. All right, now I think all of us have a, a generally favorable opinion of the word democracy. I mean, I knew growing up in, growing up in school, democracy oftentimes was demonstrative of, of the people having control or say over their government, and that was universally considered a, a good idea. Um, more and more I'm seeing democracy almost being used as if it's synonymous with freedom. And those two things are not the same. And before anybody watches this and says, oh, well, you know, Nick Freitas you know, hates democracy. No, that, that's not it at all. I think actually democracy has a very important role to play with respect to process. But I do have issue with democracy being used as if it is synonymous with the concept of freedom. So first thing we need to do, as always, right, define our terms. What is democracy? Well, democracy quite literally is rule by the people. And in most cases, what we mean by that is it's control of an organization or group by the majority of its members. Right? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about democracy. We recognize that whenever we talk about issues in society that we're attempting to deal with or whenever we're talking about um, you know, picking something that we want to do or a policy that we want to implement, you can't have rule by the people in the sense that you're not allowed to do anything unless 100% of the people agree on it. Right? So we all, we all understand it's not that. So rule by the people, it's not just rule by everybody, it's generally associated with the majority of people, everybody gets to vote, right? And then the majority vote is what carries the day. That's what we make our decisions off of. Now it's important to understand that this term has been, again, greatly misused. If you, if you look at some of the fascist thinkers in Italy, they thought that what they were doing was essentially the pinnacle of democracy because after all, they were the people's representative and they were using the power of government to achieve what the people wanted. So you, you can see different ways that this term can be manipulated by those that want greater control. What I'm starting to see in the United States is not only, again, a, a misunderstanding of democracy and freedom, but this idea that if something is democratic, therefore it is good or it is just. This is part of the argument that you see in getting rid of the Electoral College. Some arguments now are coming forward to get rid of the United States Senate, and the argument that they make is, well, the United States Senate is undemocratic because Wyoming has just as many senators as California, but California has a lot more people. So therefore, again, not democratic, which means that must be bad. Now, on the conservative side, you'll see a lot of people go, well, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Let me make something very clear. If you say that, if you treat the word democracy and the word freedom as if they're synonymous, that's wrong. If you treat the word republic and freedom as if they're synonymous, that's also wrong. Okay, a republic or a democracy, this describes a particular arrangement, but it doesn't guarantee freedom. And one of the questions that we have to ask with respect to the United States and what, what is it that we were trying to achieve at our founding, it wasn't just democracy. I mean, that clearly was not the case. And, and some people will argue that, you know, that was bad in some respects because obviously people that should have been allowed to vote were not allowed to vote. And I completely agree with that. Uh, but in other respects, it's important to understand why the founders didn't select a complete democracy or an unrepresentative republic. Right, because both of those things can both of those things can essentially both those systems of government can essentially lead to an environment where you, you don't have anything resembling freedom, other than perhaps the freedom to impose your will on the minority. And so there was there was a lot of trouble taken to make sure that the United States did not fall in to either one of those traps, either some form of, of pure democracy where the majority could essentially tyrannize a minority, or a republic where you didn't have people that were actively engaged or had the ability to be actively engaged in selecting representatives. So the best way to describe the United States, I, I would say, is that we are a constitutional republic which follows democratic processes. What do I mean by that? Well, we're constitutional in the sense that we have a written constitution. Like in the United Kingdom, they don't have a written constitution. What, what they refer to as their constitution is more of like a long-standing traditions within the legal process. But essentially, parliament can kind of do what it wants. 
But in the United States, our federal government specifically is restricted by the United States Constitution and our state governments are generally restricted by state constitutions. And that constitution gives enumerated powers. And the distinction there is, is that it's not that your elected representatives can do whatever they want, that they, they have to operate within certain boundaries and they can only exercise the authorities that have been delegated to them by the people. Right, so that, that's the first component. That's, that's what the constitutional component of that is. A republic is essentially that, again, we don't all each individually vote on every single issue. We elect representatives to then go to our state capitals, to our town councils, to our uh, United States Congress, whatever it is, in order to carry out the, the laws of the land, in order to, to write those laws, to pass them, and then enforce them. And we elect them to do that on our behalf. So we have a say in that process, but, but ultimately, we're not individually voting on every bill that comes before a committee, right? We, we expect our representatives to do that. That is more of a republic, Republican form of government. What do I mean by democratic processes? Well, there's, there's kind of two aspects to this. One, all of us have a say, provided that you're 18 and you meet the legal requirements to vote, right? And, and generally, we have universal suffrage. And again, some people argue that we don't because if you're under 18, you can't vote. Or if you live in a different country, you can't vote. So... Typically speaking, when we say universal suffrage, what we say is that once you reach a certain age, there's no legal um, there's no legal restriction on you being able to vote unless you have done something like violated the law, right? So you automatically get the franchise at 18, provided that you are a citizen of the country that you're voting in, right? That's universal suffrage. So we have that in the United States, right? We vote for our elected leaders. That's the first portion of the democratic processes that we follow within the United States. The people get to elect the leaders. The leaders once, or I shouldn't say leaders, the people get to elect the representatives. Once the representatives are in power, they also follow democratic processes. So obviously in the Virginia House of Delegates, not all 100 delegates are going to agree on every single bill. So what do we do? We follow a democratic process. We talk about it, we debate, we amend, and then we vote on things in committee. And then once we come to the full house floor and we vote on something, if it gets a majority of the vote, it passes. And under some limited circumstances, it requires more than a majority. But for most things, a simple majority will pass a bill on to the Senate where they follow the same process, et cetera, right? So that's the democratic processes. Um, now, it's important to understand the reason why we set all of those up is because in the United States, we are essentially a constitutional republic of democratic processes, right? And that's not just at the federal level, that's at the state level as well. In order to become a state in the United States, you have to have a constitutional republic that follows democratic processes at the state level, right? That, that was a precondition for joining the United States. So why did we go to the trouble? Why didn't we just make it democratic? If democracy is so good, if democracy is a synonymous with freedom, why didn't we just do that? Well, be, because there's a recognition and there's, there was an understanding by our founders, which I think was absolutely correct, is that, again, democracy is not synonymous with freedom. You can have a majority of people that vote for things that are, are direct violations of what we would consider to be um, points of individual liberty or individual choice. And so a lot of times when I see some of the arguments coming back, when I see people frustrated about something with the Electoral College or the United States Senate, or when I see, for instance, socialists uh, sometimes describe what they want to do as the democratization of the workforce. They, they essentially say that, no, it's not that we don't want authoritarian socialism where the government's deciding everything. We just simply want every single industry in the United States that has the means of production to be governed by the individuals that work within that company, right? Not the, not the owner of the company, not the person that set up the company, Right, but by everybody within the company. They want the democratization of each individual business. Here's what I see as, as being problematic with that, uh, both in a, in a specific sense and kind of a generalized sense. On a specific sense, again, it's just incorrect. It, it's, it's incorrect that democracy automatically equals freedom. It's incorrect that democracy automatically produces positive results. Um, the generalized concern I have with it is that I see more and more people making these kind of arguments to where if it's democratic, well, then therefore it's good. And here's an example that I would like to use for this, right? If you were to go into a restaurant and you were to sit down into that restaurant and you were to order your food, uh, but when you order your food, you don't get to order what you want to eat off of all the different options that are available on the menu. What you have to do is you have to pick what you're going to vote for because you and everybody else in the restaurant is going to vote for not only what you eat, but what everybody eats. So in a situation like that, you can't just vote for your favorite food. I mean, you can, but you have to not only calculate what your favorite food is, 
you have to calculate what is the meal on the menu that I like the most that I think a majority of people in the restaurant will actually vote for. So you're not even voting for your, your best option anymore. You're voting for the best option you think you can get given the majority of the restaurant. So th that's the process by which you would run a restaurant in a democratic fashion. And then once you get your meal, you know, maybe you don't want a dessert, but maybe the majority of the people in the restaurant do. Well, now you got to have one, right? Maybe you wanted one drink, maybe they want another drink. So you follow all these democratic processes and you end up with your meal and it's not really something that you wanted. You know, may maybe you were lucky. Maybe the appetizer you wanted made it in, in the majority vote, but the other ones didn't. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, why can't I just get up and leave? Well, because in a democracy, you're not permitted to, right? If it, you can automatically make the argument that if, well, if you're not willing to abide by the democratic outcome, well, then you're anti-democracy. Well, no, you're not anti-democracy in, in a generalized sense, in a, in a way like selecting your representatives, but you might be very anti-democracy when it comes to other people getting to make decisions for you that don't really affect them or that they don't need to make on your behalf or that you don't need to make on their behalf. And it's not bad enough that you would go into a restaurant like this and be forced to eat a meal that you don't like. Now you got to pay for it. Well, you don't pay for what you eat. All right. The way that the check gets divvied up is also now going to be decided by the majority of the people in the restaurant. And so if they vote that you're going to pay for half the restaurant, well, too bad. You've got to now. You're, you're legally required to or else they can punish you. So it, it's important to understand that while democracy may make a lot of sense when we're asking questions like what sort of laws are going to govern us, or if we're asking questions like who are we going to send to represent us in the process of making and implementing and enforcing those laws, right? Democratic processes for that might make a lot of sense. In fact, I think they do make a lot of sense, not because they're guaranteed to produce perfect results, but because I can't think of a better system. But it's important to understand that if you don't have additional protections, then now you have a tyranny of the majority where literally 51% of the population can do whatever they want to 49% of the population. And I think the, the reason why the restaurant example is, is useful is because we need practical examples to distinguish between democracy and what democracy attempts to achieve or rule by the majority versus fostering an environment of individual choice. And I think it's, it's very clear that what the founders intended, even though they didn't perfectly realize it at the time that they wrote the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, is that they were pushing for this idea of maximizing individual liberty. And the reason why that's so important is because when we talk about things like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, okay, well, life pretty much is the same thing to everybody. Liberty, again, relatively the same thing. Pursuit of happiness is very, very different for each individual. And so if, if you're going to rely on like a, a strict democratic process for every aspect of your life, what you're now doing is you're saying that 51% or 50% or plus one of the population will now get to decide for everybody else what the pursuit of happiness looks like. That doesn't create a free society. It doesn't create a society where we actually respect people's individual choices, where we respect their right to live the way they want, provided they don't infringe on the rights of others. We're, we're, we're now in this system where a, a majority is imposing its will on everybody else. And you can see very, very quickly where a majority might be tempted to do not only ineffective things, but horribly immoral things to the minority. Because if democracy is the standard for whether or not something is just, then presumably whatever 51% of the population votes to do to the other 49%, well, that's just because after all, that was democratic. This is the reason why it was so important when John Adams wrote that our constitution was written for a religious and moral people and was totally unsuited to any other. It's because if, if the drive is not just democracy, if the drive really is greater freedom, well, then there has to be checks on power, whether that power is democratic or not. It's not good enough to simply say that, well, because we voted for this, now we can take your property or now we can force you to work in a position that you don't want to work in. Or now we can decide what your child's education is going to look like. Or now we get to dictate what your health care looks like. 
But more and more, that's that's the argument that I see being made, and it and it it would be absurd to any generation of Americans that properly understood the difference between democracy and freedom. But because I think we really haven't taught that distinction, we consistently find ourselves in a situation where we have a group of young people that honestly believe, and, and I sat down and heard from a student that, well, of course Joe Biden has to pass these executive orders because Congress isn't moving quick enough and he has the mandate of the people. That's what you get when you don't, when you don't distinguish between protecting individual liberty and a government which is, which is built around this idea that it has enumerated powers, not just generalized powers. That's what you get. Because now all of a sudden it was no longer about, well, yes, the president has a certain amount of power and the president has the authorities that the, the office you know, possesses. But they're not allowed to go beyond those authorities simply because they won a democratic election. We didn't elect the president to be dictator or, or to decide what the will of the majority was. We elected the president by majority vote in order to carry out the very express and specific duties of the president. We elect our members and our representatives of the House and the Senate to carry out the very specific duties associated with the House and the Senate. So I think it's going to be very, very important for us to get back to more of a fundamental understanding of what some of these terms mean and not to allow for or not to excuse this common misunderstanding which has taken place right now. So how do we make the argument? Well, first of all, whenever the, the subject of democracy or a republic comes up, right, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you, conservatives, all right, and I'm, and I'm one of you. If when somebody says our democracy, you immediately fire back with our republic, okay, you're fighting a word of semantics, okay? So, so we, we don't need to get into the whole democracy and republic debate as we've currently done. Again, what we need to express is, well, no, what we are is a constitutional republic that follows democratic processes. Because by articulating that, you're setting up the conversation to say, okay, why are they, we that way? Because if, if we're just our democracy, well, then a lot of the things that some people might be suggesting would make sense if justice and freedom were defined by whatever the majority decided. So, so why did we choose a different path within the United States and why have we attempted to sustain that path? And I think that's where we get into the, con the first conversation is why do we have a constitution? There's a lot of democratic republic, there's a lot of republics out there that follow democratic processes that don't necessarily have a written constitution. Why do we have a written constitution and why does it say what it says? Because I, I think that starts the conversation into, well, we were trying to achieve something beyond deciding what the government's powers were. We were trying to achieve something beyond the majority merely dictating terms to the minority. We were trying to recognize that individual liberty is critical for a free society. That, that ultimately, most of the decisions that you make throughout your life, you would be furious if you had to surrender your individual preferences or choices to the will of a majority. Again, if every time you went into the restaurant, if every time you went into, you know, if, if every time you went into the movie theater, there was only one option and everyone had to vote on what you were all going to watch, you'd be furious with that. If everyone had to vote on what kind of house you would have, you'd be furious about that. Why? Because we have individual preferences. It doesn't make sense to take millions of people and impose a particular decision on them in most of the things that affect us throughout our lives. Most of the decisions that we make, we want the individual liberty to either participate or not participate. Choose one path or choose another path. And the reason why the Constitution puts such restrictions on a democratically elected republic was because it understood the genuine nature of freedom. All right, so. Start with that, constitutional republic of democratic process. That constitution, that explains a lot of the reason why we do that. Why do we have a republic? Well, because again, we understand that when it comes to creating various laws for society, that we want there to be a deliberative process and we want people to be able to focus on things that either will be or should not be laws. We want them to focus on that debate. We want them to go through a process that we understand. And, and unfortunately, we've gotten away with that in a lot of things that we do within our state legislatures and especially within Congress. But that was the purpose behind it, the idea of having representatives that would be focused on the people's business for a term of service, right? Not permanently, not a career, but a term of service. And then why democratic? Well, because if we're going to have a process where we select representatives, to go and specifically focus on the laws which will govern society, 
Well, then, yes, we, we want everyone to be able to have a say in those laws because they are inevitably going to be affected by those laws. And, and there needs to be certain restrictions. Obviously, we don't need someone in Paraguay voting on representatives in the United States. We don't need someone in the United States voting on representatives in Paraguay, right? It's, it's within the polity. But that's where democracy makes perfect sense. That's where democracy can, can do the best job in helping us achieve a just result. But the just result is not necessarily the bill that is passed. The just result is, is when it came time to selecting the people that would represent us within government, everybody had some say in that process. And then when it comes for those representatives to decide what it, the course of action the government is going to take, it makes sense that a majority of those representatives would get to make that decision over a minority but not in anything they want to do. They still have to stay within those proper boundaries within the Constitution. So a, a big, a very helpful tip when we're discussing this, whether it's with a student or whether it's with a friend, is to properly articulate why the United States government was organized the way it was. And then to make sure that we don't use the word democracy as if it's synonymous with freedom, that we don't use the word republic as if it's synonymous with freedom. Because ultimately, when we talk about democratic processes, when we talk about republican processes, we're typically talking about how they relate to government control. And the most important thing to remember out of all of this, if you, if you heard nothing else I've said, is that any government is inherently capable, regardless of how it's selected, is capable of running roughshod over individual liberty, over private property rights, over your ability to pursue happiness in accordance with your definition of it, not some political elite. And, and I have found that when we, when we frame the conversation correctly and we're not trashing democracy or we're not trashing a republic or we're not suggesting that one or the other is the end all be all, when we get back to what is the purpose of any of it with respect to our government? And I would say that the foundational purpose was to maximize individual liberty so that people can be happy, healthy, prosperous, and free. But in order for you to be able to pursue happiness, genuinely pursue happiness, purpose, meaning, in accordance with your definition of it, you have to have the individual freedom to be able to do so. Because if, if, you're, if your concept of freedom is imposing your will on somebody else, that's not freedom, it's dictatorial. I don't care if you got a majority vote. So let's keep it in the proper context. Let's once again emphasize the importance of individual liberty and, and properly define liberty as your ability to live your life the way you want, provided you don't infringe on the right of someone else to do the same. Now, somebody else might make decisions you don't like. Okay, but unless those decisions are directly infringing on your liberty, I don't think we should automatically be running to our, our elected representatives and saying, hey, I want you to force that guy to stop doing what, I don't, what he's doing. I don't like it. Okay, well, is it affecting you? Well, no, not really. Is it, is it infringing on your liberty? Well, no, not really. Oh, well, maybe you should just leave them alone then. Because while you may feel like you'd be in the majority today imposing your will on somebody else, you might not be in the majority tomorrow. And unless we want democracy to break down into nothing more than two wolves and one sheep debating on what to have for dinner, then we're going to need to put more emphasis on individual liberty and the different checks and balances that we have against all government, right? Whether that government was dic or um, democratically elected or some other means, protections against government power is essential to preserving freedom. Democracy might be a good way to rein in the power of certain elected representatives. It may be a good way. It may be something that contributes to providing for greater freedom in society. But it is not a guarantee, and it is not the same thing. And if we can get people to understand that, then we can get the argument back down to the basic level, the fundamental level of what is it are we trying to achieve? Do you want people to be happy, healthy, prosperous, and free? Do you want them to be genuinely able to make their own decisions based off of their preferences? Or are we going to take our society and essentially whittle it down to nothing more than majority rules. Because I promise you that will not create a free society. And I promise you it will not create a just society. So it's very important. When we see someone using democracy as synonymous with freedom, when we see someone using democracy as synonymous with justice, 
we need to break it back down to the fundamentals and say, well, wait a second. No, really, what is a just outcome? And what does a free society really look like? And then we can talk about the role democracy can play in that process. And again, this may sound obvious, but I, I am telling you, I cannot believe the number of younger people that I talk to that believe democracy is, is essentially the same thing as freedom or justice. So we have to get back down to that fundamental argument, make that, and I think you'll be surprised at the results you get. Because on, on top of just properly defining terms and making sure that they're properly understood, I think what this also does is it puts the question back onto you know, what does a free society look like? What does a just society look like? And now we can have more productive conversations about what that actually is, as opposed to using these little cheat words that get us out of having the entire conversation. All right, well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for joining us on Making the Argument. Please like, share, and consider writing us a review. Also, if you have any questions for us, you can go onto our Facebook page, put your questions in there, or on our YouTube channel with Making the Argument with Nick Freitas. You can go on there as well as leave questions. I read through there. I try to get in there and comment as much as possible. And as always, we use your comments, suggestions, and questions in order to inform us on what episodes we should do in the future. So please participate. Once again, I'm Nick Freitas with Making the Argument, and thank you for joining us.